The universe is an amazing place. In our galaxy alone, there are 100 billion stars. And there are 100 billion other galaxies out there. And that's just in the observable universe. Well, we're about to meet a man whose work has shown that all that matter that we know and love is just the tiniest, tiniest fraction of what's out there. The work won him a share in the 2011 Nobel Prize for Physics. And his name is Brian Schmidt. Aged just 27, he led the team that discovered dark energy. Yeah, it, it's a pretty fundamental change. The universe is not primarily made up of stuff like you and me. We're made up of normal matter. It has gravity and it works in a way that we're used to. What we're, our result says is that the universe is made up 80% of something completely foreign that we knew nothing about. The discovery was off the scale. And while the percentage is being revised down, our understanding of the universe will never be the same. Today, I'm keen to find out more about this man who tweets as Cosmic Pino. I mean, it's a massive discovery. Isn't it? I mean, well, 70% of the universe. Yeah. So, uh, as one of my colleagues once said, well, you can only do that once. When people ask what you're going to do next, not discover 70% of the universe is the correct answer. But did you have any inkling at any stage that you would win a Nobel Prize? I didn't even dream about winning Nobel Prizes. It was like becoming President of the United States, just not something that was on the cards. When we made our big discovery in 1998, you know that it's a big thing. I have to admit, it wasn't clear to me it would ever win the Nobel Prize because it was, you know, something we really didn't understand, we still don't understand, and my view was, if we wait till we understand my result, I'll be dead. So and You can't win it when you're dead. You can't win it when you're dead. Fortunately, Brian is not yet 50, and he's got every intention to spread his passion for science far and wide. Space is just full of energy. There's energy everywhere in space. Then that turns out to make gravity push rather than pull. But we needed 70% of the universe to be that energy we didn't know exist. Here's a guy who's won the ultimate prize in science, the Nobel Prize, and he's still got time to teach kids science. So that's the problem. We can run physics back in time and we can squeeze things more and more and more. You've actually contributed some of your Nobel Prize money to the education of primary kids. Tell me about that. Yeah, so Primary Connections is a program which is all about enabling teachers to teach the curriculum in a way that's proven to work and is engaging for the kids. So that when they get to secondary school, uh, they're not turned off, they're actually engaged. If there was another universe, what would happen if they clash? Would they clash or... Well, you know, presumably, they... if we had two universes, they would have different physical laws. But in the end, if there are multiple universes, it turns out to be really, really hard to tell that they're there. Because, of course, if we could see them, we'd probably consider them part of our own universe. And so you always wanted to be a scientist. You never remember a time where you wanted to be a fireman? Or... No, nope, I cannot remember. I mean, my father started his PhD when I was three. And so my mother had a job, my father was doing his PhD, so he had to look after me a lot. So I'd be in the lab and, you know, poking around with him at all times. I can remember one time uh, my father had a rat that uh, had died, and uh, as my mom came in, my father was doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on the rat, <laughs> and then goes up and gives her a kiss, and my mom's like, ugh. So, yeah, I have, I, it's just from day one that I remember this. You never looked back from that. You thought, that's uh, for me. Yeah. No, my mother never looked back from that either, but uh, anyway. <laughs> Brian's own education was funded by revenue from the Alaskan oil boom of the 1970s, when PhDs taught at public high schools. Compared to the public education I had up in Anchorage, Alaska, no jurisdiction in Australia, public or private, spends as much money as what the public education spent on me. And that's something to think about. We think we're, you know, really spend a lot of money. No, we don't. I think we are under-investing and our kids' education. And, uh, you know, when we cut corners there, we're actually cutting corners for the future generations. And a commitment to the future of astronomy is seeing Brian's Mount Stromlo headquarters forging some remarkable new science. Ah, so what have we got here? So this is our adaptive optics laboratory. And so the whole game in the future of running telescopes here on Earth 
is getting rid of the atmosphere. There's all sorts of little pools of turbulence. It causes a beautiful twinkling of the stars. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And so you don't want to have that twinkling because it smears out the images and it means ultimately we can't see as crisp and as faint objects as we would others see. So the key is to get rid of the atmosphere's bad effects, that twinkling. And to do that, you have to shine lasers into the sky, you make an artificial star, you see what that star looks like, and you essentially take that out, because that artificial star you put up has been warped by the atmosphere, and you de-warp it. And this system here is a prototype for what we would put on a telescope. Okay, a de-warping system. A de-warping system. And Mount Stromlo's research isn't just limited to doing science on planet Earth. Pretty impressive looking piece of machinery. It is an amazing piece of equipment and it's the only thing uh, of its kind in Australia. And it's what we call a thermal vacuum chamber. So it's, it's kind of like a space simulator. That's right. So we can recreate the conditions of space here. We can go through and pump things down to a vacuum and we can make it hot and cold just like going in and out of sunlight. Our hope is to have this capability up here at Mount Stromlo that we can build up a cottage industry that includes companies you know, from Western Australia, South Australia, here locally, to start a space program here in Australia so that we have a capability of doing our own satellites. But to do that successfully, you need to have equipment like this. No sense building a piece of equipment, putting it up in space and find out it doesn't work. You're a Nobel Prize winner now, which puts you in another category. Do you think that that will help in some way in terms of promoting science in Australia? Well, I'm hoping. I'm really trying to get the government to think strategically about how it funds us, to think what they want out of us, and act on it. That's what I see as my role, is to get government to think sensibly about science policy. Brian's flair for science and strategy were fundamental to the discovery of dark energy. It was against a backdrop of intense rivalry between Brian's team of astronomers and a competing team of particle physicists. And tell me about that competition between the groups. Was how real was that? Oh, that was real. That was seriously real. We talked about working with each other, but we had such fundamental different ways of looking at how to do an experiment. And they said, hey, it's nice of you guys to come on late. We've been trying to do this for six years and you've been causing us nothing but pain. And we're like, you idiots, you guys don't know how to do this experiment because, you know, you haven't been listening to us. So there's just a culture clash. And that was a good thing because they had their way of doing things. We had our way of doing things. We weren't dumb. We looked at what they did to discover their objects. We adopted it immediately. And that competition meant we worked more quickly. We worked much more efficiently. We were much more careful. And in the end, I think it was a necessary condition for us to make the discovery we did and have it be taken seriously. So you think that? You think that competition really helped for science? I think it was very important. It wasn't very pleasant, to be honest, but I think it was an extraordinarily important part of getting that science out when we did. Astronomers are very open source. Everything I've ever done has been available to anyone. All our data, grab, you want the original files, they're yours. You want my software for finding supernovae, I made it available, even to the other team if they wanted it straight up. Because I believe that's the way science is done. If you want science to go forth quickly, everyone in the world needs to instantly have access to that technique so they can check your work out and then they can build on your work. That's how science moves quickly. What's next for you? Do you feel like you've reached some sort of pinnacle now and there's, it's all downhill from here? Uh, in some ways, yes. I mean, your ability to do things like when you were 27 changes as you get older. You get more responsibilities. I'm much wiser than I was when I was 27. I can see the answers to problems very quickly now that I couldn't when I was 27. But I don't have the time to just sit down and crank through them. Is this your property here? This is. This is Bipe and Ride. Beautiful. It is home, and I love it. Just up the hill from the family home, Brian has put down roots of a different kind, a small vineyard of Pinot Noir. So has That's it been it. a good winter? It's been a little wet, but it's because it got very warm and very cold, the vines are highly confused right now. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to tell what's going to happen. How would climate change affect your vineyard here? Well, it's something we need to worry about. Pinot Noir, which I grow, is the variety that needs very cool weather. This is a quite a cool site, uh, but it's getting warmer. 
So on the other side of the vineyard, I've planted a bunch of Shiraz. Right now it's really not warm enough for Shiraz here to grow properly. But my deal is I'll make one barrel of Shiraz each year. And when the Shiraz is better than the Pinot Noir, we move everything over to Shiraz. So yeah, I'm planning, planning for, for the future, that's yeah, yeah. right. Until then, it's Pinot and pizza. For high flyers, Brian and his partner, economist Dr. Jenny Gordon, seem well grounded in the realities of life. Raising kids, working hard, and perhaps burning the candle at both ends. So, well, I mean, you lead a pretty varied life. You're not just sort of a guy focused all about astronomy and that's it. You've got wineries, family duties. You know, how hard is it balancing all that stuff? Uh, it's a challenge, but you know what the boundaries are. The winery needs to have work done at certain times. I make sure I'm here. The family needs me around more than I'm around. So, in many respects, the family probably takes the biggest hit. I do try to make sure that when I don't have to work, I don't but unfortunately I work more than I should and that's probably the part of my life that I need to deal with the most because I am away more than I want to be. Should be drinking more of your red. Absolutely. <laughs> it is a fine drop and as the pizza sizzle, I'm reminded of that line from Banjo Patterson. And he sees the vision splendid of the sunlit plains extended and at night the wondrous glory of the everlasting stars. <laughs>